Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Our guests today are Phil Harvey and Lisa Conyers. Phil is an entrepreneur who has founded a thriving business, so he's a philanthropist who has created numerous nonprofit organizations, and he is the author of five books. Lisa Conyers is the co-author with Phil Harvey of The Human Cost of Welfare. She is a nonpartisan consultant to private clients and think tanks, and she focuses on economics and public policy issues. Phil and Lisa's newest book is Welfare for the Rich. This is the first book to describe and analyze the many ways that the federal and state governments provide handout subsidies, grants, tax credits, loan guarantees, price supports, and many other payouts to millionaires, billionaires, and the companies they own and run. Phil and Lisa, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You know, I have to share in the spirit of full disclosure, I was feeling my stomach churning, my blood boiling as I was doing my research for the book. There's so many things going on out there, and I can't think of a more timely topic, but I'm left with one question. How do we fix this? And you both have written this wonderful book. You've written numerous books together. So I think First, Lisa, why don't you kind of introduce a little bit about yourself and how you started to work with Phil and we'll get him on the line and let's go from there. Phil and I have worked on two other books together. So we've been collaborating on different projects for probably a couple decades now. Our last book, as you mentioned, The Human Cost of Welfare was a book that was about the welfare system in this country. And while we were working on that book, we started thinking about federal spending and and looking at where else it goes and discovered that there's a lot of welfare for the rich going on too. A lot of our tax dollars that are going to rich people rather than people who need or that you normally think of as needing welfare. So we thought we'd do a book about that. So that's how that all came to be. Fantastic. And Phil, you know, you Lisa said you you both have been working with each other for a number of years, and tell us a little bit more about your background. Well, I I think got together with Lisa because I knew her parent quite well in India, oddly enough, where she and and her family were living at the time. This is back in the 1960s. That's how far back I go. So we've known each other uh, off and on through her parents. The development of the first welfare book with, that described the system, uh, our current welfare system, we, we kept coming across things that were wrong with our current welfare system, and there are a great many such things. But when we stumbled on something that turned Robin Hood on its head, that is programs that took taxpayer money from working people and turned it over through a whole variety of mechanisms to millionaires and billionaires, the big guys winning out consistently over the small ones when it came to corporations and to farms. The relevance, I think, also to the current situation, the theme that the big boys always win is the Paycheck Protection Program, which is part of the CARES program of relief during the pandemic. And this is a $660 billion program, which is a big chunk of change. It's it's the same as roughly the entire defense budget of, of the United States. And it was designed to help small businesses, their employees. But as often happens in these cases, the big boys manage to find a way in at the small guy's expense. A uh, restaurant chain called the Fiesta Rent Restaurant Group, which has a capitalization of $189 million and, and 10,000 employees, got a $10 million loan right off the bat, while the smaller businesses were struggling with the Small Business Association paperwork, which can be very intimidating. So we just see in all of the things the government does, somehow the little guy gets left out and the big boys kind of muscle in and get more than their share of government appropriations. So the question I have, and it's interesting that you highlighted our current issue that we're all facing this pandemic. And I have to say again, with my, my stomach churns and I get angry, I think that that's the correct behavior. When I read about the big corporations getting 
these massive payouts in small businesses. I mean, even what coming from Chicago, a lot of small businesses were really struggling. And then you hear about these big chains and organizations getting their payout first. There's got to be a reason for this. How does this happen? And why do we keep going down the same path all the time whenever there's a crisis and we try to spend our way out of it, money gets distributed, but then the guys at the top, 1%, whatever you want to call it, half of 1%, they take their cut first and we're left with the, if we're lucky, we, we get a few crumbs. How does that happen? Well, I think one way that we all know that it happens is through lobbying, right? If you have a voice in Washington, if you have the ability to pay a lobbyist, the the payoff is pretty good. For every dollar you spend on lobbying in Washington, you get $760 back. That's a pretty good return on investment. Very good return. Yeah. So I would say that that's definitely one thing that happens. And often, you know, these things start out with good intentions, right? I mean, the Paycheck Protection Program was supposed to help the little guy, but who had the accountants and the lawyers to figure out the fancy paperwork the fastest? Well, it was the big guy. It was NFL teams and things like that. It wasn't my friend who owns his little marine supply store, you know. So those that were that were in the know and could follow the paperwork and, and were on it, they got their paperwork in first and took the lion's share of the funds. So it's knowing the ins and outs of Washington and it's lobbying and things like that, which the average guy is too busy running his business to be. I mean, most of the small business owners that I know that tried to apply said it was it was really onerous paperwork. I think those are a couple of reasons. Another way is simply having good connections. Howard, you're from Illinois, or you have some background in Illinois, I gather, where the Pritzker family is very well connected, very well known. The governor is a man named Pritzker, and one member of that family, Penny Pritzker, who inherited much wealth of the previous generation from that family, is a billionaire herself and received uh, $1.6 million in farm subsidy payout, not because she's a farmer, but because some of the property that she owns is farm property uh, or is farmable property. So she gets a bundle of cash. A billionaire really needs that farm subsidy, no doubt. But being very well connected with families in positions of power is another a way, in addition to direct lobbying, that these things happen. You know, fair enough. I think we could go from state to state and there's going to be that mega rich individual. And I don't think it really matters what side of the political spectrum they are on. They have the resources and the funds to get to the front of the line first, as you kind of alluded to, uh, Lisa. I guess the question, you know, when we talk about the, the book, Welfare for the Rich, what is then the purpose of the book and how is it organized to not only to educate us, but also to provide a recipe or a process for these are how things should work and these are the steps we can take. Because I used to work for a manager. I mean, God forbid you went into his office with a problem and you didn't have, here's the three solutions I can think about. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? So tell us about the organization of the book. And so how, and how can we address, again, using this COVID-19 and the payment Paycheck Protection Program as an example, how do we prevent this? Because, you know, we can't keep circling the sandboxes over and over again. It won't be easy, but I think, uh, and Lisa, jump in here anytime because you've done a lot of work in this area. One thing that everybody can do is get involved in their own community politics, if, if that's the correct term, in their own community activities. As soon as you're working together with other people trying to improve your community and the lives of people who live in your community, you begin to get an an idea of, of how the systems of money moving in various unpredictable ways come about. In addition to getting involved with community, there are, of course, thousands of counties with elected offices. And if you're so inclined, there are many possibilities for getting elected to important positions in a county or even in a state. On top of that, and here Lisa's done most of the search and looking around, there are a number of organizations that spend a lot of time tracking misspent government money. One of the most active is Good Jobs First, which has a website, Good Jobs First, all run together. And Lisa's taken a good long look at them. They provide 
research and training and counseling. They're looking out for a lot of misspent taxpayer uh, programs and policies. And that's a very good place to look for help, for advice. And of course, they'll ask you for money, but they don't, you don't have to provide it in order to, to, to get their help. Open the books is another uh, organization that is focused on transparency. They want every American to know what's going on with these programs and with government spending. They want taxpayers to know where their tax dollars are going. And that one too, I think, Lisa, is openthebooks.com or openthebooks.org, one of the two. And for really good source of information about all this, they are very, very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the last chapter of our book has a whole list of organizations that we really think are doing good work on this. And what I found is that the most important thing is getting that data. Yes, getting, you know, the open the books is trying to open all federal and state spending budgets to the public so you could get online in your town and see where all your money's going. I think, and that's all been pretty recent. That's all big data stuff. That's stuff that's happening because of the technology we have now and the ability to demand to be able to see where our tax dollars are going. But then the other side of it is people like Phil and I who write about this kinds of stuff and supporting the journalists that are writing about it and the right people that are writing books about it and getting that information out there. Because just looking at a spreadsheet of your local spending might not be that interesting. But if you can get interesting stories out of it, you know, that sort of get people's attention, I think that's super important. And that's, you know, really why why we wanted to do this book is that, you know, there's so many stories out there. And I went all over the country digging up stories on all different subjects that were related to this and, and then try and make it more real to people. I would tell people about, you know, I'd be visiting some town. I'd say, did you know that right over there, that guy's getting all this money that comes out of your tax pocket? And they'd say, what? I didn't know that. I think educating the public in, in interesting ways is important also. You know, I'm curious. Uh, I interviewed the president of the university where I received my coach training and graduate degree at Fielding Graduate University in Santa Barbara. I got to give a shout out. I'm sorry. When I interviewed Katrina, she had co-wrote a book with a number of university and college presidents. And one of their prime reasons for this book was to highlight the importance of not only education of civics and how government works, but also the importance of getting involved locally. And Phil, you highlighted that, you know, when we, we started this line of, the, of our conversation and just the importance of getting involved locally. And, and I will be the first to admit, I mean, well, I just turned a big number of age and I just have never been actively involved. I mean, I, I read, I participate in certain discussions. You know, I, I unfortunately, I focus, or maybe fortunately, I focus on trying to pay the bills every month, okay? And I look back and thinking, I could have done a better job of getting involved locally. And I think, you know, what Katrina had shared about kids at the high school and college level learning about civics and government and getting involved in a activism, whatever that looks like local. But what you just said, getting involved in the community, knowing where the, the money is being spent, taking the opportunity to pursue a role in government, whatever that be, the city, the county, the state. Uh, I think this wonderful. And how do we do that? I mean, I have a sense, and again, I'm probably guilty of this. How do we get us off of our duff, buff, butt? whatever that phrase is, and go do it. What's, what's going to put that spark in us to, to get, make that happen? Well, I'd like to believe that it's hearing stories that get you all angry. Like you're, you know, you said that you get your blood boiling when you started reading some of the stuff in our book and you, and maybe if some story had been local to you, you would have said, Hey, all right, that's enough of that. You know, I want to get involved. And so I think that exposing the stuff and getting people angry is important. You know, just telling the stories. I think stories are what it's all about. There are examples in the book of people who you know, there's Pete Eshelman, who's a farmer in Indiana who had never been particularly involved in local politics, but he became a farmer there and wasn't happy with the way things were going around, you know, agriculture issues in his area. So he he just said, you know what, I I want to get involved. It's, and it was something that was near and dear to him. And, and so he decided that it was time to take a stand. In fact, there's several farmers in Indiana that I interviewed, and some of them are featured in the documentary that goes along with this book that, you know, got involved because something just doesn't seem right to them. And, and they decided it was their time, you know, to get involved. I think that if there's an opportunity to do something in a community, 
a small or a medium sized or even a larger community. That's going to have an impact on people you know, your family or friends, simply people you know, because an issue gets a lot more important uh, if it's connected to your own circle of, of friends and acquaintances and neighbors. So that that's something else that helps, I think. Okay. You know, uh, Lisa, you mentioned the documentary, and I don't want to inadvertently shortchange it. So let, but I do have a question afterwards. But let's talk about this documentary. When, when, when is it going to be available? So it's a documentary that's being produced by Free to Choose Network, and it is scheduled to air in, I think, spring of next year. I'm not sure. I think May of next year. And some of the stories from the book made it into that documentary, and then there are stories that are in the documentary that that the producers found outside of what we had in the book. So um, it's called Corporate Welfare. Yeah, so look for it in, in the spring of 2021. Excellent. And I'm curious, what were some of the challenges of producing this documentary? I mean, with the book, it's an interview. You know, it, at the end of the day, the, the, the person you're interviewing can say, I, wanna, I don't want to share my name because uh, for whatever reason. The, <laughs> that happens a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but the documentary, that's a little different beast because it's kind of hard to hide because you are in front of the camera. So what were some of the challenges that you had with getting people on and wanting to talk about things that are going on in their community? Well, the producers are very good at their jobs and they found people that were willing to talk and they found stories where they're actually, you know, there's a there's a success story in the documentary and there's a there's a sad, you know, not success story. but in both cases, the people that they interviewed really wanted to tell the story. It had been in the news. It wasn't, you know, something that, that they were doing in the dark or anything. So they were already quoted in, in newspaper journals and things like that. And also, like, you getting back to the outrage or if you feel really strongly about something you want to fight for it, you know, that can be enough to get you over your fear of being called out. I mean, I've had people, you know, approach me, and Phil probably has too, about this book saying, aren't you a little worried because you call out the names of a lot of wealthy people, you know, aren't you a little concerned? <laughs> and, you know, my sense is everything that we found, it wasn't like it was hidden. We just made sense of it. You know, I mean, all the articles that, that we quote about, whether it's Bill Gates or Elon Musk or whoever, you know, it's just, you, you can't be afraid to take on the big guy, I guess, is, you know, don't let fear get in your way, do it anyway. And if somebody sues us, It'll be great for book sales. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic for book sales. What I love about this work is, I mean, there's enough stories to be a spark to get your blood boiling. But you also talked about some of the success stories. Can you share a couple of those? Well, there's one in Louisiana that was a great success story. Since the 1930s, Louisiana has sort of had a rubber stamping process for energy companies and all those big guys along the Gulf, um, you know, Dow Chemical and Exxon Mobil, all those guys, when they build these refineries, there's this little commission that they go to and they ask for tax abatements and tax relief. And they, you know, they go and they put in their application and they say, you know, we don't want to pay property taxes on this property. And they get these abatements over and over and over again. And some local citizens in Baton Rouge stumbled across this because they got outraged at the fact that every year Louisiana kept ending up on the bottom number 50 on USA Today's list of, you know, the health of states and, you know, where's the status of the states. And they were dead last in health and education and poverty. And, well, actually top, I guess, in poverty. But some of these local citizen activists just got together and said, why is that? We have all this wealth. We all have all this natural wealth. We have all these big refineries and all these big oil companies here. Why are we so poor? And then they looked into it and they discovered this commission that basically has allowed these companies to avoid paying their fair share of taxes for decades. And so they decided to create an organization and fight back. And they went to lots and lots of public meetings with lots and lots of people and they made a big noise. And what they requested was that this commission be expanded so that local school districts and police departments and fire departments had to have a seat on the board. So you could no longer just, you know, go to this commission that was basically appointed by the governor. You now had to actually tell the school district why you didn't want to pay 
<laughs> property taxes in their parish and police departments and fire departments. And so it's a great solution. And it's only been implemented for about a year and a half now, but it has made a difference. I mean, now those guys can't just think, oh, I'm just going to get away with this. And hopefully it'll lead to a lot more property tax income for the parishes and some you know, positive impact for residents. Excellent. You know, there was a, a news story, and I'm sure you're aware of it. It was in the news this past week about General Motors. I believe it was in, I want to say Youngstown, Ohio. I could be wrong, but it was definitely Ohio. And the community was de- demanding the its tax. They got a, a tax incentives for opening the for opening this plant and employing, but then they decided to close the plant. And the community is basically saying, or the state saying, we want our money back, and uh, which I think is great. Yep. Well, there's so little accountability with so many of these programs, and even the Paycheck Protection Program that we're looking at right now. I mean, you cannot find out who got what. I mean, there were some big, you know, early names that came out, like Shake Shack and the NFL team that took the money. Somehow, you know, word leaked that they had gotten this money and they returned it. But that's just two instances, you know. I mean, and there, even though there is a Congress did appoint a committee of five people or something to, you know, sort of oversight, but even they do not have the right to look at who's getting what. And so I don't know how many years it's going to be before we find out who took all that money. But that's the kind of thing that I think is so important is accountability and transparency. We should, I mean, we're the taxpayers. It's our money. We should be able to see where it went. Very much, very much. There's one other interesting success. One of the major football stadiums, I think in California, Lisa can probably remember which one, was actually built and completed without any taxpayer money. It was funded by the team owners, by uh, normal uh, borrowings and so on, which is extremely unusual. We looked at the pattern of of, uh, funding something like 20 football stadiums across the country, and every one of them had a big input from local tax dollars. People tend to accept that a little more readily uh, because it's fun to have a stadium uh, in your town or in your area. But the fact remains, this is taxpayer money going to really wealthy people because you don't own a football team unless you're very, very rich. You know, in Chicago, I live literally a stone's throw from Soldier Field. And I think in the 19 years I was in Chicago, I was probably in two or th- at two or three games for the reason if I wasn't invited, if I was invited, you know, that was nice, but I couldn't afford it. So why am I giving my tax dollars to build a facility that I can't even afford to go to? It's not, you know, maybe they open it up for the, the kids or for the occasional, you know, high school sport event. But as a taxpayer, I don't get any benefit out of this. And it's interesting you mentioned about the football stadiums because that's always a a huge controversy when the the owner of the stadium says either give me a new stadium, give me the brakes, or I'm going to take my toys and leave. And we're almost like held hostage to this. And it's it's mind-boggling to me. So I have a question. And we live in a uh, society here in the U.S., that is increasingly polarized. The, you know, we have very loud and transient voices on one side. We have loud and transient voices on the other. And we've, we're increasingly losing the ability to listen, to understand, to have a discussion, to understand one another's point of view, and then come to a consensus. Uh, consensus in some cases, can be a very good thing. But in our society today, it's a lot of it is win, I win, you lose. I get from the book and our discussion and looking at your website that this straddles both political spectrums. Are there folks on both sides? I would say, are they reasonable folks on both sides that you can have a discussion and agree, this is bad, we shouldn't, we shouldn't allow this and let's come together and fix this problem? Or is this one political party or slant or one or the other? What is, what is it from a political spectrum? Well, the, the idea, the principle of taking taxpayer money from workers and turning it over to wealthy people and very wealthy corporations 
isn't defended as an idea by anybody, as far as I know. The, the idea that we should take from, from workers and give it to the rich, uh, as I mentioned before, turns the Robin Hood principle upside down. You don't get people who defend, uh, to, to defend that as a matter of principle. But when it comes to individual programs, the $96 billion that goes to the farm interests every year, you'll find, well, uh, that particular program is essential because farmers need help, including multimillionaire farmers who routinely figure out ways to violate the, the maximum asset, maximum income limits the farm bill is supposed to have. The Jones Act, which is a, an, an absurd regulation that requires all ships carrying anything from one U.S. port to another U.S. port, including Hawaii and Alaska, be a U.S. flagship manned by U.S. citizens for the command of a, a U.S. captain. Well, this almost doubles the cost of moving cargo around the United States. And, and it's particularly dramatic in moving products from back and forth from Hawaii to the to the mainland. That was a big issue with Puerto Rico, wasn't it, When the, during the hurricane, because it was so costly to get supplies there? Yeah, ab- absolutely right. There was so much pressure that the president granted a temporary retreat, uh, a temporary uh, removal of, of that regulation, which I think lasted for about a week. And some foreign ships were able to uh, carry some important cargo to Puerto Rico. But uh, as soon as the immediate uh, emergency was over or seemed to be over. The rule changed back to the way it was before. And now we're all paying more for a whole lot of product than we should be because it costs so much to haul from New Orleans to Boston. Right. Right. So I have a two questions for each of you. Same question for both of you. One is looking back at your careers, did you know then that you were going to be doing this kind of work today? Or has this been an evolution, a, a refinement? And looking, looking back, how hopeful are you for our future? Well, you know, I've known, as Phil said, I've known Phil my whole life and, and we've done interesting work. I mean, we've done three books and we've done different projects. And I think it's all just sort of one thing has led to another has led to another. I There's no way I could have predicted back in, you know, the 90s when we did the first book that we'd be doing a book on welfare and then to go on and do corporate welfare. I mean, it just sort of part of how this book came about was just talking to people around the country while I did the welfare book, when I would do interviews and they say, well, why don't you talk about all the rich people getting, why are you talking about people on, you know, just barely getting by on welfare payments when these, the rich fat cats are getting, you know, way more. And so it just started being this thing that Phil and I would toss around and say, you know, it is, it is time to, to maybe talk about this, you know, and, and sure it's perennial, maybe it'll be here forever, but that doesn't mean you stop blowing the whistle and, and stop complaining about it and, you know, demanding change because there has been change over the years. There have been, you know, positive results, but I think it's, it's been an evolution. I don't think I could have predicted that, no, that any of this was, ha- <laughs> was happening or was going to happen. And it's been, you know, it's been fascinating to see these books come to fruition and then have documentaries on PBS about them. It's just been, it's been quite the journey. To answer the other part of your question, are we optimistic? And I'm probably more optimistic than Lisa is. It's a very personal part of one's own psychology, but I'm very optimistic. Good news is not very interesting. So you don't read a lot about the fact that the entire human race is vastly better off uh, today than it was 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 years ago. There are far fewer people who are on the verge of starvation. There's more food per capita available now than there ever has been in the history of the human race. More people are living in relatively free societies. Uh, Democracy has had a slowdown for the last 20 years or so. But if you look back a little farther, we're living freer, better nourished lives than we had any reason to expect when I was born back in 1938. Life expectancy has gone way up now that you're 40, Howard. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, oh, I get it wrong, did I? Uh, well, thank you, anyways. <laughs> life expectancy has gone up 
everywhere, not just in the United States and Europe and the, and the wealthy countries, but it's gone up in sub-Saharan Africa. It's gone up in Bangladesh. So a lot of things have been happening that are good. You don't hear a lot about them because the media know that we'd much rather read bad news than good news. And there's plenty of bad news to go around. So that's what, that's what fills the, uh, the newspapers and the televisions and even the podcast. Sure. Is, I'm curious, with the, the newspapers, is there a, a news outlet that you both would recommend for news that is well-researched and, dare I say, unbiased that you would recommend? Well, as long as I've been working on these projects, I've scanned the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and then a lot of local papers. And I just kind of take, you know, take a bit from everywhere and, and, you know, try and get a bigger picture. I think sticking with any one news outlet, whether it's Fox News or MSNBC or NBC or whatever, it, it is doing yourself a disservice. If you have the time, you know, do, and, and some of the news aggregators are really good. I mean, like Google News, you can, you'll see 10 stories listed about the same subject. So you can really get, you know, but you have to just take the time. I think a lot of people just, you know, put their radio on one channel, their TV on one channel, and that's all they hear. And that's dangerous. As and uh, Very dangerous. Very dangerous. And Phil, I don't know. What do you, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite news source? Well, there, I agree with you. I wouldn't recommend just one. But I do think if you, if you tend to read the left-leaning media, like the Washington Post and the New York Times, Wall Street Journal is a, a good balance because their perspective, while it's not hard right, is at least a pro-business and generally a conservative. So I guess my general recommendation would be to read and listen to newspapers or stations that you tend to disagree with. I found that Fox News, for example, which I disagree with much of the time, is actually quite good about providing what seemed to me to be pretty straightforward facts. So it's a good idea to, to look beyond the, the channels and the outlets that are uh, making you feel good um, by agreeing with you or presenting things that you can agree with very easily and, and read some of the ones which many uh, and many of them are not bad, particularly the Wall Street Journal, which I think is an excellent paper, that uh, won't just tell you what you want to hear. Fantastic. Phil, Lisa, in the time we have left, uh, we have a feature we often do on our podcast. It's called an insight to go. So because our podcast is called Success Insight, our insight to go is an opportunity for our guests to offer some insight, a book, a lesson, or something they want to leave our listeners with. And so, at least I put you on the spot first last time. I'll put Phil on the spot this time. Phil, what would you like to leave our listeners with, given this great body of work and, that you're doing with Lisa and you know, the, this new book, Welfare for the Rich, and the upcoming documentary. You said you're hopeful for the future, but anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, since you gave us the opportunity, I'd certainly like to suggest that they all go to Amazon and uh, look at the Welfare for the Rich book, which uh, will be officially released on the 4th of August, fairly soon now, and, uh, and, and buy it, by all means. Uh, there will be a Kindle version available at a very reasonable price. That's the first thing. The other, the other items we've already gone over, get involved, get off your duff, get in there and, and do something which is remarkably easy, even with uh, the lockdowns that, uh, that we're going through in so many places, either still or again. And because getting involved in almost anything is good. Fantastic. And oh, Lisa, before you answer the question, I do have to ask you, I mean, for our listeners, uh, we are having this discussion with our videos turned on. Phil is in his very comfortable home. Lisa is in, on a sailboat. So I have to ask, Lisa, what's the name of the sailboat? Windward. Windward. Okay. Okay. Um, I once had a boat named after me. It was called Howard's Fault. Uh, <laughs> but if I, if I was going to have another sailboat, it was going to be called Impulse Power. No, but, there you go. There you go. So, what, what, Lisa, what's your insight to go? Well, I mean, it's funny that you bring up living on a sailboat, but I would just say in general, the the opportunity that I've had working with Phil on these projects has been the opportunity to talk to Americans from all over, you know, the country. And, and I think that learning to just 
hear people's stories and be able to talk to people from all walks of life. I mean, we talked about, you know, are there people on, you know, is this a political issue? What I found is that people are more human and more alike than we are different. And that the more that we can go out and talk to people that we don't know or may not agree with and hear their stories and share their stories, the better off we all are. And some for some people that's scary, they don't want to leave their bubble. But I would say that the more you do hard things and scary things, easier they all get. So don't be afraid to go out and work on your first political campaign or, you know, get involved in some issue in your community because you'll just find a bunch of other people that are also, you know, really care about each other. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Before we go, I'm sorry, Phil, you were going to say something. I just said here, here in the here, British here. tradition. All right. If we had a cocktail in our hand, it would be chin chin. So right. before we leave, uh, I would love uh, if you would let our listeners know if the, where would you suggest they go to learn more about you uh, and your work and also about the book? You can go to, the book has its own website called welfarefortherich.com. And on that website, there's a media page that has, well, all of the podcasts that we've been doing and interviews and, and op-eds that we've had published are all under that tab. So you can find, and you can, there's a bio section, you can learn more about us. And actually on that website, there's a tab for our last book too. So if you want to learn about the Human Cost of Welfare book, you can learn about it there as well. And then um, Phil, if you want to talk about DKT Liberty Project and other places to find you. Well, and the bio sections, both on Amazon, the book is listed on Amazon uh, already, even though uh, it, they're not selling it yet. The bio sections there are fairly complete, although they don't contain a lot of negative information, I'm happy to say. But the DKT Liberty Project also uh, describes some other activities besides the book, activities involving civil rights and civil liberties, particularly, and the war on the war on drugs. The war on drugs has been a terrible, terrible influence on criminal justice, racial prejudice, and a lot of what is wrong with United States culture today. So there's some description of those activities and probably some of the same information about me and Lisa that, that uh, we've already mentioned on the bio sections of, uh, of the book's website. Fantastic. Well, we will most definitely uh, leave uh, links back to both websites, Welfare for the Rich website, as well as the DKT Liberty Project. And we'll have the back links to Amazon webpage so folks can pick up, like me, a copy of the book. Mine will be a Kindle because one thing I've learned moving across country I have a lot of boxes and there's a lot of books in those boxes. So right now, everything is going electronic. Uh, Phil and Lisa, I, I truly appreciate you coming on to the Success Insight podcast to uh, chat about your work in this wonderful book, Welfare for the Rich. And yeah, I will admit again, I get angry when I hear some of these stories and perhaps a wake up call for me to even in my new home here in Las Vegas to find a way to get involved. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I'm sure our listeners on the Success Insight podcast will appreciate those insights that both of you have shared as well. And uh, thank you for, for being on the show. It was great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Phil Harvey and Lisa Conyers, authors of Welfare for the Rich. Uh, now, again, we're going to provide links back to the website, Welfare for the Rich, as well as the BKT Liberty Project website. And we'll also make a note when the, uh, the documentary that is going to be published sometime in uh, September, when is it going to be? Corporate, oh yeah, the one-hour PBS TV documentary, Corporate Welfare, and it's uh, produced by Free to Choose Media. It's based on the Welfare for the Rich book, and this uh, will air May of 2021. We're definitely looking forward to it. We can't wait. So folks, hope this has been a fantastic subject. And like me, if you don't get just a little bit angst or feel that angst, get a little bit angry, go out there and make a difference in your community. And as Phil had said early on, you know, start local, uh, a local issue that you're passionate about. Same thing with Lisa said, start local Get involved and listen, have conversations, and be the reason for change. And, you know, there's an old proverb, a Jewish proverb called tikkun olam. You're not obligated to complete the task, but neither are you uh, free to abandon it. So you may not fix the problem, but at least you can 
play a role in addressing it. So go out there, take a look at the the book. Uh, it's going to be uh, available very shortly, Welfare for the Rich, uh, on Amazon and the other uh, major book selling sites. And it's going to be a great read. So folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.